Motorcycle racing gets you two ways. It's risky. Fingers and femurs snap like twigs when it goes wrong. And it goes wrong at least as often as it goes right. Racing is also expensive, ruinously expensive. In this episode of El Camino, we look at the madness, the glorious madness of motorcycle racing. is brought to you by Yamaha. Revs your heart. Got sports. No shortcuts. Best Western hotels and resorts. Welcome to El Camino. I'm Neil Graham. Steve Beatty did it all. Flat track titles in Canada, a race win in the US, the top of the heap. And like every racer, he crashed. It's part of the game. You don't know your limits until you sail past your limits. But Beatty's crashes were something else, gruesome highlight reel disasters. And yet, he survived. To cap his career, Beatty, in his mid-40s, took one last shot at a championship. But he forgot one thing, to tell his wife. Being the wife of a racer definitely is stressful and nerve-wracking at the races, watching him compete. Rider that could take home the Canadian National Championship. Give it up for the number 26, Steve Beatty. There's been a few races where I had to turn and walk away because I couldn't watch anymore. It was just too scary. Well, 2006, I said that I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I've had enough. Okay, okay, yes, I'm done. We're done. So in my mind, he was retired until one day he said, I think I'm gonna go race Leamington. You can come with me or you can stay home. It was him going out to have fun. So, in my mind, that was retirement for him. I don't really care about the championship so much as everybody thinks. I've, I've got a bunch of them on the wall, and, and I'm just back here racing and having fun. That was about June that I was clued in that uh, Steve was going to do the whole year, go after the championship. It's definitely uh, an addiction, one that's not easy to get rid of. I always remember back to Earl Hayden, told my dad once that you know, racing was worse than drugs because drugs, you can go to rehab, but for racing, there is no rehab. The green flag dropped and um, Steve got a terrible start. I think he was like fifth or sixth. And I just remember seeing, sorry, seeing him come out of corner two and the bike was completely sideways. And at that point, something in me just knew that this isn't gonna be good. As I was running over there, I was, I can remember praying the whole way and getting over there and he wasn't moving. One of the safety workers was feeling for a pulse and I heard him tell the lady that was also there, he's got a pulse. <sighs> this huge sigh of relief and go, okay, all right, next step. And then when he started to come to, I remember, you know, hollering at him to move his hands, move his arms, your legs. 
you know, they were wondering about putting him on a backboard. And I'm like, yes, of course you put him on a backboard because he's, you know, broken his back before. He's, you know, broken his neck before. He needs on a backboard. This segment is brought to you by Yamaha. Revs your heart. I just wanted to finish off the season in one piece and go home with my number one plate. Well, didn't get very far, did I? Got, uh, best of my recollect recollection, I got to turn two, was in fifth, motorcycle started to drive pretty decent, and then out of nowhere it snapped sideways on me and the uh, rear of the motorcycle swung out to the right and then swung back to the left. So I leaned to the right and I turned the throttle wide open to try to get the motorcycle to lay down and spin me out on my side and not flick me out on my head. And when I see the video, it did what I wanted to do. I just was in a bad spot and it looks like I got ran over by two, maybe three motor, you know, three riders. Um, for sure too, because I've spoke to those guys and they were pretty upset and wanted to, uh, apologize. And I said, Hey man, not your guys' fault. I was the idiot that fell in front of you. So yeah, it was my fault. You know, <clears throat> my brother was in that race and he was almost one of the ones that ran me over but he was able to avoid hitting me. And when he dumped his motorcycle and came over to me, you know, and he pretty much thought I was dead. And, uh, yeah, must have been a shitty feeling for them. Cause Michelle was the same way. She was, She's seen this a few times and she was running across the track, praying to God that today wasn't the day that I was going to, you know, not wake up. So, yeah, thank Christ that, uh, yeah, my ticket wasn't punched that day and I'm still here to talk about it. been tough. It's been a, a tough go of it, but, uh, you know, he's slowly starting to get his, the old Steve back. So this too will hopefully in another month or so will be, you know, not a distant memory, but maybe not quite so, so raw in another month or so. <sighs> not sh I'm not sure what I would do if he said he was going to race again. I really don't know. Because this has been, this has been tough. I think that, because uh, when he was hurt 10 years ago, we didn't have Ryan. Ryan wasn't born yet. So I think this is definitely different this time around um, for him. And having Ryan see him hurt, you know, that's dad, that's in pain, that's, you know, upset. That uh, it's been, it's been tough on Ryan too. You know, he, he saw the whole thing, so he, you know, has that in his mind, as well as seeing the recovery process. And it's it's tough, you know. Steve's had a couple of really bad days since he's been home, and that's hard on Ryan as well. You know, I have them both. I'm trying to, you know, keep their spirits, you know, both of their spirits up. So that would be a tough call if he decided to go back racing again. I really hope and pray that he's done this time.
I kind of feel that my racing career has kind of been the years of uh, doing good and getting hurt and then getting lured back in. You're on that fishing line and you get sucked back in again and you get a few race wins and that keeps you going. And then you get hurt and you're like, man, and then you get back and you feel good and you start riding again and shit. It's just uh, it's an addiction, you know? Not that I've done drugs in my life, but it's kind of like a cocaine addiction, I guess. You know, because the average person looks at you and thinks you're crazy after breaking your neck once. Now I'm gonna tell people I broke my neck twice and I'm probably still gonna ride motorcycles. I don't know if I'm gonna race anymore. Man, I got a little kid here. He rides. And a couple of motorcycles behind me that he rides. And uh, pretty tough to tell him that we're not, we're not gonna ride bikes anymore. And again, I'll heal and I'll get strong again. And it's an addiction. And I don't think I can, I don't think I can quit riding motorcycles. I don't know what's gonna probably be in wheelchair. This will finally shut it off. But uh, something we won't talk about. This segment is brought to you by Best Western Hotels and Resorts. Like Steve Beatty, Trevor Daly doesn't hold back when he's on a motorcycle. Here's a man who crashed so hard, he stripped the wiring harness from his superbike. The wiring harness. Oh, and he broke both of his wrists at the same time, too. But a week later, Daly showed up to race. And in practice, a mechanical problem caused him to crash again. He hoisted his bike back onto its wheels and pushed it off the track with his forearms because, well, his wrists were broken, so he couldn't use his hands. Then he stayed up half the night swapping the wrecked engine. And then, after an hour or two of sleep in the floor of a cube van, which isn't really sleep because Daly doesn't sleep, he raced again. Don't be fooled by Daly's puppy dog look. He's as hardcore as they come, with a will as ironclad as a front end loader. It's hard to think about how much of my day is devoted to this uh, in a specific number, but uh, it's definitely on the 80% end um, from day to day. And I wake up, I train three to five days a week for racing. I then go to work or get up and work to be able to afford my habit of racing. And when I'm done that, I'm either training again or working on my race bikes. Or going to the track, or working on pit equipment, or looking at data from past races and watching, racing on TV, watching past races I've been in, watching those races so I can see how my competitors ride and passes they might have made. And if I were to think about it from someone else's perspective, it definitely could seem a little crazy how obsessive it is. Obsessive? I'd say so. Daly lives in his shop next to his welder and his metal lathe, a few feet from his race bikes that get covered up at night like children tucked in by their parents. Those matched pair of race bikes live like kings in a castle, their every need and want fulfilled. Cost be damned. And damn, don't those costs add up. One of the things we'll start with is the front suspension. Um, you've got your internal cartridge kit. E everything the bike comes with, you pretty much take it apart, throw it in the garbage. It's uh, not to say it's not good, but again, it doesn't give the rider the feedback uh, and the control and the accuracy to that control and feedback that the aftermarket suspension does. What's that gonna cost you? Well, to start with the front, we're about $3,000 for the cartridge kit. Then you've got the installation, and then you've got all the extras that come with it, which are the extra springs and then any tuning with it. You're gonna want different springs to do different things, to put different forces into the tire. Some days, the track temp's different than others. The tires can't take a certain force. 
you're looking for a different feel on the brakes, you're looking for a different movement um, when you're on the gas, whatever it may be. So each set of springs is an extra 200 bucks and I've got four different springs uh, for this bike and four different springs for that bike. And we're just talking the front. For the back of the bike, you've got the rear shock, something you're constantly tuning. So much of the super bike is all about rear grip, using that power and saving that tire. So, you know, your accuracy of what you can change on the rear shock is really, really important. And the more uh, tunability you have, that more accuracy, the more quality in the components, you know, that can cost you. Um, the shock is anywhere from 1500 upwards of $5,000, depending on the manufacturer, for what we're allowed to use in Canadian Superbike. And, uh, and again, that's just taken out of the box. Then you've got setting it up for your rider preferences, which is done by a professional, as well as, again, your extras, your springs, your different valving, your different shock lengths. It's a never ending process in what you can change and you have to have all the stuff there to be able to change it. Wheels, probably looking about $2,000 a set. Each bike, I've got about four sets. And then you also have extra wheels for rain tires. Each set of tires is $530, and we use anywhere between seven and nine sets per weekend, plus extra rear tires for qualifying. You've got two front rotors per wheel. They're about $1,100 a set. You've got one for the back. The back, I use a standard rotor. The rear brake on the Superbike, you're not using near as much as the front brake. Brake pads are anywhere from $150 per caliper, which you've got three on the bike, upwards of $500 per caliper, depending on which system you're using. Brake fluid, liter is about $150. Your clutch, you're looking at about $300 every time you change it. You know, you're looking for obviously using premium oil, premium products in the motor, looking about $125 per change. Again, doing a couple of race weekend. For the linkage is uh, about $1,000 uh, for a quality one. And uh, when it comes to the front triple clamps, there's a variety of different manufacturers, particularly ones I use, uh, which are uh, pretty standard, are about $2,500. The elephant in the room of a superbike, the motor, the heart of the beast. Uh, they make about 170 horsepower at the wheel stock um, these days. We're making uh, you know, about 25 horsepower more than that. Doesn't seem like a lot, but to go from that 170 to the 195 is a huge investment, not only in parts that you put in, camshafts, springs, um, the whole valve train, uh, a lot of that which is for power but also for reliability. And then there's the, the amount of labor for the, the porting, the finishing, all the details that go into assembling it and making it last. You're looking anywhere from twenty to $25,000 just to have it in the bike. This segment is brought to you by AGV Helmets. Protect like a champion. Trevor Daly's race bike costs are now up to an eye-opening $130,000. But that's not the end of it. In fact, we're nowhere close. So on the bike, there's a couple major components with the electronics we change. There's the main wiring harness, and then there's also the computer that controls all the sensors to the harness. Another aspect we change is being able to go in and change all the parameters in that computer. So there's essentially three parts to it. Cost of that, you're looking about $35 to $4,500. Another aspect to it is a person who can come in and read all that data and knows how to specifically change all those parameters. And that is almost more important than the system itself, is having someone that I as a rider can talk to and relate what I'm feeling what I want more of, what I want less of, and who is able to put that uh, into their fingertips through the laptop and make the changes um, that I need. And that systems analyst can be anywhere from two to $5,000 per race weekend. And for me personally, I fly someone in from across the country and it's probably one of the most important parts of my program is uh, having that relationship and the person there to be able to control everything we need to. So we've talked a lot about some of the major components that we change on the bike, but the details and all the small things we change are really never ending. We've got a quick shifter here, that's $450. A titanium swing arm nut, $85. 
Got a titanium front sprocket nut, $120. Got a lightweight performance chain, $400. We got lightweight performance sprockets. I probably have eight of them for different gear ratios. Uh, they're about $200 each. We've got a titanium battery box, a lightweight battery. Probably took about 12 hours to move that battery, as well as it's a $400 battery. We've got these crash protection, about $400. Titanium nuts and bolts to hold everything together. They're probably $25 each, and there's probably 20 of them on the bike. And then we've got to feed the crew. Madness, yes, but there's a reason for it. Daly wants to win a pro superbike race. He's been close, seconds and thirds, but never that win. And he's getting older in his mid thirties now, racing against teenagers. And he knows time is running out. I feel I haven't achieved what I know I'm capable of in terms of uh, race wins or even championships. And it's definitely uh, the nature of the beast that I know if I win a championship, I'm going to want to win another. It's not like that's the, uh, you know, tick the box and, and move on. But, you know, there'll be a reality in, in it that, you know, this has been, it's been my life for a lot of my life. And, you know, there's, uh, I'm sure there's a point on a, on a personal level that, you know, there might be other important things that come into my life that need and deserve the attention to detail and the commitment that uh, I've given this. Thanks for watching El Camino. Clothing was provided by Importations Tebow, service you can trust. El Camino was brought to you by the Motorcycle Super Show, the big one by the airport. Dynasy, 75 years of performance. Hudson Henderson, your insurance provider for motorcycle, power sports, and marine.